conclusion will save them. John's vision of Patmos promised ultimately the revelation of Jesus Christ and his blaze and glory. So in Revelation chapter 22, Revelation 22, I'm going to commence in verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is the Lord Jesus describing himself. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city of heaven. For without, in other words, outside of heaven are dogs, and sorcerers, and fearmongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst, Come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life. Really. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And from the things which are written in this book, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And amen. As we're all aware, the Bible speaks, of course, about Christ's first coming, his incarnation. God manifested in the flesh. But it speaks more, focuses actually more on his second coming, especially regarding the book of Revelation. Last month we addressed the issue of the proper response for believers regarding the imminent return of Christ. Verse 6, verse 7, sorry, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly. And verse 20 says, Surely I come quickly, the imminent return of Christ. And this is why the hymn writer, I believe, is a great in verse 5. I know not when my Lord may come. You see, folks, the church is not waiting for a sign. The Jews require a sign. The Lord will return at any time. And that's why I personally believe that we will be taken before the day of the Lord, the wrath, the great tribulation period of this world, because if the church was going through the great tribulation, then we would see the signs all around us, knowing the Lord could come. This is why we need to be rallied, because the Lord could come at any time, like the days of Noah, like the days of Lot, they were just getting on with their normal business in life. And suddenly then, the day of the Lord came upon them. It is remarkable, especially having studied this great book of Revelation for the last, I don't know, two years or so, with its catastrophic judgments during the great tribulation, which God sends from heaven through his angels, judgments upon the natural realm, judgments upon the spiritual realm, there is no escape. As we have the seals when a quarter of mankind is destroyed, then we have the trumpet judgment when another third is destroyed, and then we have the vile judgment, the bowls, which just is foreseen Christ's return, and which there is no more mercy or grace upon the inhabitants, sinners in this world. What a time that will be. The return of Christ, you see, in his blaze and glory to punish his enemies. And then the Lord, of course, in this book of Revelation, we've studied for the last past few years or so, we've looked 
looked at the judgments, the great tribulation period, and um, we've looked at Christ's place and glory. We've looked at the Saturn in the throne room in heaven. We've looked at the angels of God. We've looked at the second coming as Christ comes and lives in glory. And then the crush of enemies, the crush of the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and chaos, Satan in the bottomless pit, and then openly the lake of fire. We've studied the millennial kingdom, thy kingdom come, a kingdom of peace and justice and righteousness. We have looked at the eternal state, having that glorious place for the redeemed of the Lord, a place of perfection where there's no sin. And then we've also looked at that horrendous, terrible place, the lake of fire, in which all Christ's rejectors will end up for eternity in complete torments forever and ever. But yet God again, who is rich in mercy, closes his eternal word is eternal revelation to us. The canon of scripture with an urgent invitation for sinners to come to Christ and which we have read from this passage this evening and receive eternal life before there is no more opportunities before it is forever too late. Do you realize tonight you are in borrowed time? You are not in control of time of your life a split second, someone could pass on the eternity of this meeting tonight. George Whitfield preached it up tremendous, but yet very solemn facts. It's appointed on the man wants to die and after this is judgment. Um, when he was preaching this, somebody dropped dead in the middle of the congregation. Tonight we're going to look at the final invitation Christ gives to this fallen world. To make their peace with the living God. The general invitation of, you know, we have the general invitation which goes out to every person. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it is a general invitation, a call of God's wonderful salvation in Jesus Christ, which has been hurled out once again from this passage. Even at the conclusion of Holy Writ, for sinners to be rescued from the awful, terrible danger they're in, from the wrath to come, they are without an excuse. So as we look at this passage tonight, first of all, we're going to go straight into verse 17, because there were all these other verses surrounded. This is the main text tonight. This final invitation to fall on mankind. In verse 17, and the spirit of the bride say, Come, and let them that hear say, Come, and let them that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let them take the water of life freely. This is the final invitation. What mercy God has shown. Three times in this verse alone, the word come is mentioned. There's two distinct invitations in this verse. The first come is related to Christ to come. But the other two comes are related for sinners to come to Christ being their final invitation. The Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead, the Trinity, desires Jesus' return. Because it tells us in verse 17 a on the Spirit Say, come. That is speaking of the Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of God's desire. Why is that? Why is the Holy Spirit saying, come, referring to the Lord's return? Why is that? Well, it does not specifically state the reason in the text. Why? But there's a strong possibility because throughout the history of men and women from the very fall of Adam and right through until this whole world is concerned on God who is in the new heavens and the new earth, men and women have been in total rebellion by continually to reject, 
nor mock and even blaspheme the work of the Spirit of God, whose ultimate ministry, his ultimate office, is to testify, is to glorify, and is to point them to Christ. That is the ultimate office of the Spirit of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, his office was to do the Father's will and to glorify the Father. When Christ walked this earth, the Spirit of God's ministry, and now Christ is in the glory, is to glorify Christ, make men and women aware of Jesus Christ and lead them to Christ in the process and the miracle of regeneration as he convicts and converts. Mankind as a whole has provoked, resisted, grave, quenched, blasphemed the Spirit of God throughout the generations, even from the beginnings in Genesis. You look at the days of Noah, what does it say? My spirit shall always strive with man, and as a result, God in his mercy had a preacher of righteousness who preached to them, and he just didn't preach to them, he gave them an object lesson where he built the ark, Noah, 120 years, seven days. And um, what happened? My spirit shall always strive with man. God then cut man off. Millions upon millions, maybe some Butler says a conservative quote of coming one billion people estimated 1600 years down to the generations from Adam right through to Noah and then there came a point of judgment upon the world. And only eight souls were spurred. Also throughout the history of the nation of Israel when God chose Israel on himself they were supposed to be a light they were meant to glorify God through the Gentile nations, but sadly the vast majority of them failed because of their wickedness, because of their sin, because of their idolatry, because of their rebellion, because of their hard, stiff hearts, the evil heart of unbelief. Um, even they were in the wilderness. They rebelled because they were in the wilderness for 40 years. That generation was wiped out in God's judgment. They grieved the Spirit of God. Then in the period of judges, God many times, I think it was maybe 11 or 12 judges, God raised up to deliver them. And yet they went back again into their own rebellious, sinful ways. Then if the kings appeared, if the kings, 40, 42 kings, and there's only 8 kings classified as good out of 42, and as a result they went into, they went into and the Babylon, Assyria, and Babylon are God's chastisement. And then when Christ came to earth just around 3,000 years ago or so, what happened? Christ came on the zone, the Jews, but they received him not. And that was brave and quenched and rebelled and blasphemed against the Spirit of God. But it will reach its apex, its pinnacle. As the sinful, rebellious world, under the influence of Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet, who will do signs and wonders, will parade their high mounted blasphemous actions in rejection of Jesus Christ during this great tribulation period. The evil folks will be at the highest level ever in the history of mankind. During the Great Tribulation, just for seeing the return of Christ, who will execute perfect wrath and justice upon them, upon them when he returns in glory, grace and glory. Throughout the long, dark centuries of mankind's deplorable evil sin and rebellion, the Holy Spirit has been at work, of course, bringing regeneration to Christ's bride, with conviction and repentance being granted by regenerating them, saving them by his wonderful grace. The long suffering, grieved, blasphemed Holy Spirit's desire surely is for the bridegroom Jesus Christ to come in his blazing glory, to crush his enemies, so that Christ will be honored and glorified. The old prophet Habakkuk 2, verse 14. This is why we pray for thy kingdom to come, O Lord. This is the main reason this verse. I'm going to 
quoted twice because it's so important. It says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. That will happen when the Lord returns and blazes glory. That is why us believers who are saved should pray that our kingdom come. Ultimately because it's all for God's glory. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So on the positive side, the Holy Spirit will not be completely satisfied, pleased, until the Lord Jesus Christ is totally glorified. Which is the Spirit's office, which will happen on his awestruck, incomprehensible return. When every eye shall see him, there will be no escape. The last view, the word of God of Jesus, as they continue to mock the name of Christ and the person of Christ, the last view, the word of God of Christ, was the Lord in his humiliation on a cross between two criminals, rejected, despised, and mocked. The world thinks it was a failure. But the Holy Spirit longs to witness his fellow member of the Trinity, exalted, worshipped in his glorious beauty, splendor, power, majesty, and blaze and glory, which will happen as Christ returns in triumph on his second coming, in which the whole world will witness as every eye will see him from humiliation coronation, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is a day of reckoning coming. There is a day of coronation coming. And I wonder tonight, have you, Christ, as your King and Lord tonight, is he the preeminent one in your life? But the Holy Spirit is just not the only one who longs for Christ's return, but also his bride. Who is the bride? The bride is the people who are saved, who belong to Jesus Christ, who are redeemed, who are the sheep of the Good Shepherd. These are the ones whose sins are all gone, who belong, who are in a personal, living, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who his bride is. Verse 17 there. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, the church, in other words, the true church, the spiritual church, say, Come. Throughout the centuries, God's people in every generation have longed for, waited for, prayed for, hoped for, desired for, and anticipated the Lord's return. Even when Paul said, the Apostle Paul longed for the return of Christ. This is why we pray that our kingdom come. Yes, God's kingdom has come to us tonight who are saved spiritually. But there is going to be a little kingdom when Christ returns to this earth to set up mainly for the Jews. It's a kingdom, a millennial kingdom, and we will reign it with Christ. This is why the Jews, even the disciples, ask the Lord about the kingdom. When is it going to happen? God's people, they say, hate the corruption, the injustices, the high common sin. The wickedness all around them. They long for the day when their bodies of corruption will be replaced with bodies of incorruption, fashioned in the likeness of Christ. No more trials away from the presence of sin forever. To be with Christ, which is far better. No more death, no more pain, no more heartache, no more worry, no more anxiety, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more attacks from the devil. No more fear, no more temptation, no more persecution. They long for having a place of overwhelming love, peace, rest, joy, security, as we will serve, worship, and reign with Christ forever and ever. They will not even be a one misunderstanding, no awkwardness, not even a negative thought, as we will be like Him, giving, giving glorious, redeemed, resurrection bodies, fit for having time and eternity. Is there any wonder I has not seen you, has not heard light, has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them and to them alone? Is there any wonder Paul mentions with delight, not just for himself, but other believers, that them, the believers also, that love is appearing? The 
true believer in Christ longs and loves and longs and, and wants and desires and, and loves Christ's appearing. It is natural, but yet supernatural for every true believer in Christ to long for his coming as they are all born of the Spirit, partakers of his divine nature, as believers are destined for eternal fellowship with Jesus Christ, as their true citizenship is in heaven. We're only pilgrims passing through here. Our true home is in heaven. The church will never be fully satisfied until it is presented to God in all our glory. It's not perfect at the minute. But someday it will be perfect without spot or wrinkle. As a church, the bride will be completely perfect, not just in her standing, but also experientially. Charles Spurgeon, the good Baptist preacher, says, Oh, that the Lord will come. He is coming. He is on the road and traveling quickly. The sound of his approach should be music to our hearts. So the spirit and the bride's desire is for the second coming of Christ. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. But well, there's a change of direction in this verse, perspective, regarding the, the word come here. The Holy Spirit's desire is for Christ to come, second coming, so Christ will be ultimately glorified. That's the Spirit's office. The bride, the church, longs for Christ to come. So we will be with the Lord forever and ever in heaven to worship Him. To serve Him and to reign with Him forever. But now it changes direction in this verse 17. This time the invitation is no longer for Christ to turn. But for the duty of the sinner to come to see them faith in Christ. To be prepared for the return of Christ. Verse 17, it says, 17b, and let him, individual, personal. You see, it's a personal salvation. It's between you and the Lord. And let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that has a thirst, Come. And whosoever will let them take the water of life freely. To be saved and prepared for the return of Christ, you must come God's way. There's only one way, it's an exclusive way. And it's by humbling yourself, recognizing you've broken God's law, and repenting, finish for your sin, trust in Christ to save you, to take you in. From your, and deliver you from your sin and from the wrath to come. The Lord Jesus gives out wonderful invitations still today. Many people get invitations, and us too, go maybe to birthday parties or wedding invitations or other invitations. But the greatest invitation which still goes out today is from the lips of Christ. It is still open to sinners. But well, we're in borrowed time, every one of us. Every person in this world is in borrowed time. And when God decides the soul to be required, it will happen. What grace and mercy, but it could close at any time. And what is this wonderful invitation? Come unto me. These are the words of Christ. This is the invitation of Jesus Christ. It is incredible that Christ has given us an invitation. Come unto me, all ye of labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because sin, you see, makes, crushes us and ruins us and wrecks us. Come unto me, all ye of labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God gives us a rest, a peace, a love, a joy. But this world is not their song. An assurance. That swell with our souls. That we're not under condemnation no more. We've been justified with peace with God. It is the greatest blessing to ever the mortal man or woman ever is to have your sins gone, peace with God. Have you heard and applied by faith the call to come? You see, this is the final invitation. And let him that 
dare say, come. And let him as a thirst come. Jesus says himself, come unto me all your labor and have you then, and I will give you rest. Have you heard and applied by faith the call to come? You see, there's a general call to everyone across the world. But then there's the effectual call. Have you experienced it? The effectual call of God. Have you redeemed for his black people? That's what happens when God deals with a sinner. That's the ones who are saved spiritually. Saved by the grace of God. They have applied it. Applied Christ in their lives. You see, there's a general call and an effectual call. When a repentant sinner is truly converted, then, then he or she will start to thirst after the things of God. Their lives will be completely transformed from within. They have a new nature. They're a new creature. They're, they have a new disposition. They have new desires. They have a new outlook. They're all, they have a new dimension in life. They're not conformed to the things of this world. They have a new dimension. Their citizenship, you see, is in heaven. They belong to two words. Yes, we're in this world, but we're not really of this world. Our true hope is happening. They're new creatures, they're new desires, the new master, Jesus Christ. They've been regenerated, God's life, the miracle of regeneration through the Spirit has anchored their soul. God has actually anchored their soul, their spirit. Being born again of the Spirit of God, God's nature of them. Those are the people. Who have experienced God's affection call. They've applied by faith by God's grace, of course. They've taken heed of the word of God. Come unto me, Jesus says. The text says, Let them that hear it say, Come. As the word of God goes forth tonight, when you hear his word, are you coming? Let them as a thirst come. This is the final invitation to mankind. Dear friends, tonight this could be your final invitation. God is the only one who knows your soul could be taken. You might never ever hear me ever preach again for you. This could be your final invitation. But a person who comes by God's grace, of course, through the regeneration and work of the Spirit of God, through the facts of all of God, then They'll have a thirst after the things of God. Because the text tells us in verse 17, say, And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So, surrounding this text and the passage we've read tonight, there is four incentives for sinners to accept this final and great invitation of saving grace. Four incentives. As, we, as this text we surround it with the other verses of Scripture. The first incentive is because of whom Christ is. Verse 13, I am Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The first incentive for sinners to come is because of whom Christ is, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is precious. Jesus Christ is wonderful, majestic, glorious, perfection. Jesus Christ is love. This, this final invitation comes personally from the exalted, majestic, glorified, eternal Son of God. The Lord repeats a faithful identification of himself regarding the same emphasis here in verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. A faithful identification of himself. The Lord identifies himself as Alpha and Omega. This is the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The beginning, he says, which is the source of all things. Then it says on the end, which is the goal of all things, the first and the last, that shows he is the eternal one. Which expresses in a nutshell, Christ is infinite, he is eternal, and has boundless life, transcending all limitations. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. You can never escape Jesus Christ. There is no escape. Every knee will 
little boy. Whether in humility on salvation, blessing in this earth, or else, folks, they will bow in God's judgment and cast them to the lake of fire forever. Christ transcends all limitations, he is infinite. He lives in the power of an endless life, he is eternal. And all things are possible with him. What a supreme being. He is the great I am. The self-existent and self-sufficient one. When he was administering on earth seven times, he clasped, he labeled himself the great I am to show that he is God. Someone said this faithful description describes the completeness, kindness, and sovereign authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is, which is a convincing testimony to his absolute deity being the eternal Son of God. But to go even further, the Lord also identifies himself as in verse 16, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He is the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. It is interesting to note the root is buried in the ground. Where no one can see it. As the stars in the heavens where everyone can see it. The root is buried in the ground. In the natural realm where no one can see it. But the stars in the heavens where everyone can see it. The root and offspring of David identifies Jesus before David. Root you see. Before David in his eternal state Christ. And then the offspring of David in Christ's humanity after his birth and the lineage, the ascendancy of King David, Jesus being a Jew and also being a Jewish national name. He is the root and offspring of David. He was before David, but then he was after David. He was before David in his eternal state. Because he's God. But then he was after David. Christ was born about a thousand years or so after David. And his humanity, offspring. Which the prophets told on many, many different occasions. That the Lord Jesus would come from the line of David. Why the bright and morning star speaks here in this verse. He's the root and offspring of David. But he's also the bright and morning star. And the star speaks of Jesus' universal, exalted name. As one who speaks of humility in his line of, of his humanity. But also it speaks here of his majesty and glory. Who is truly God, fully God and fully man. Jesus is a God man. Two natures being God manifest in his last. Even Balaam, the greedy prophet, gave an accurate description referring to the prediction of the coming Messiah by calling him a star. And Numbers 24 says, There shall come a star out of Jacob, that means out of Israel, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The morning star here announces dawn's rising soon arrival. The morning star announces Sun rising, soon arrival. If you ever up early in the morning, that time of the morning, you just see the sun, the dawn rising up, and it's lovely to behold. Another new day. You see, the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come for his bride, the church, as the morning star. But when he returns to judge the nations, it will be the sun of righteousness, holiness, and burning fury, Malachi 4, verse 1 to 3. So this should inspire God's people to purify themselves as He is pure, to keep themselves clean, devoted to Him as we look for Christ's return. The second sign of this is because heaven is exclusive. Heaven is exclusive. This should be an example for Believers as well as sinners. Heaven is exclusive. Verse 14. 
Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers, fearmongers, murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth me of a lie, heaven is exclusive. To know a true believer is someone who delights and obeys consistently the commandments of God, which are not grievous to the true child of God, but, but are his treasure. They are precious to him. The true believer consistently, you see, applies and obeys God's word. Blessed are they that do his commandments, it says in verse 14, that they may have a right to the tree of life, speaking of heaven, and may enter through the gates into the city. The true believer applies God's word to his or her daily lives as it continues to transform and sanctify them, being their roadmap, instruction manual, being a lamp under their feet and a light under their path. Because a true believer has God's nature within as the Spirit of God besides dwells within their born of the Spirit, God's Spirit has, has taken up his residence within. He will want or she will want to please the Lord, being in that exclusive, intimate love relationship with the Lord. That's what salvation is. In a nutshell, it is being in love with Jesus Christ above everything else in this world. Are you in love with Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord tonight? Is he your Savior? Is he the one who is preeminent in your life? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. God's people who are exclusively in Christ have all their sins removed, cast away. Praise the Lord. As Christ has atoned, the sacrifice has been done once for all. For his people, as Christ has atoned by his righteous blood for their sins, and now the power gives them the power to live godly lives, to glorify his name. As sin does not have dominion over them, sin is not their master, in which they will enter heaven. Verse 14 Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But the great contrast is sinners have no power over sin as the devil of sin is their master they are slaves to it and cannot keep the commandments of God which excludes them from heaven as they are still in their pride holding on to their sin in which they have never truly been born again or truly cleansed their sins have never been truly cast away, forgiven, justified by Christ's blood. Because in verse 15 it says, This is a contrast for the ones who will not enter heaven, for without are dogs, sorcerers, fearmongers, murderers, idolaters, and whomsoever loveth to make a lie. Christ rejectors, people who do not keep the commandments of God. I'm just going to go through this list in verse 15. Very quickly, dogs, what does that mean? Dogs in biblical times, dogs were not domesticated household pets we have today. No, they were despised scavengers lurking around the cities of the towns, garbage dumps. So to call a person a dog was to describe a person of very low character, which were blatantly impure sinners. Forced to scribe in the scriptures for male homosexual prostitutes in Deuteronomy 23, verse 18. Then we have sorcerers in this list who will not enter the kingdom of God. They're born from heaven. They're bound. There's no hope for them. We have sorcerers. Sorcerers is pharmakia or pharmakias in the Greek. Where we get our English word pharmacy from. People who are engaged in drug abuse, which is prevalent across our society, normally then opens up all types of other sin, including about getting engaged in the occultic practices, unclean words, and they will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven either. Another group who is excluded from happiness, her mummers and moral persons. 
where we get the word pornos, pornography from, who are engaged in perverted sexual unclean activities, including pornography, unclean images, and all types of sexual perversion, they will not enter the kingdom of God either. And God has called his people in the holiness now to uncleanness. Then we have murderers here in this list, which God forbids. We have the action of murder, physical murder being carried out, and then we have the, the spiritual motive of murder, because it is not just an attack on another individual, which God despises and abhorrent and forbids. It's just not the physical attack of murder upon that individual, but it's also the, the spiritual attack within Jesus says that if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Why does God hate murder? It's because it is an attack just not on that individual. It's also an attack on God who has created all people in his image. It's an attack on the image of God. So murderers, people who are full of bitterness, hatred towards one another, they don't even need to carry out physically the murder, murderous act, but if they have it in their hearts spiritually, Jesus said it himself, and that's why the Pharisees were shocked. If you have murder in your heart, if you have hatred and bitterness towards another brother, he says you'll not enter the kingdom of God. Another group who are excluded from heaven is idolaters. Our land is absolutely paralyzed with idolatry, which are those who have replaced God with something else being their idol, their God, which delights their passions, floods their minds, floods their emotions, and they place God in an unacceptable manner by degrading the evaluating God. Why is there churches across our province tonight, folks, dwindling? When years ago, many churches would have been full. There was a hunger after God. Now, there's a great apostasy because the land is full of idolatry. People love their idols before God. The final group of listeners who are excluded from heaven are liars. Liars, of course, covers many, many, many different areas. People lie to cover their sin. People lie to want to be popular, want to fit into the crowd. People lie maybe looking for promotion and work or something else. People lie regarding uh, could be fraud, benefits or whatever else. People lie, especially false teachers who preach false doctrine. The bottom line is, and that's only a number John has covered here, but there's many more. Subjects, categories of people who will not enter heaven, but they will enter the lake of fire and second death. The bottom line is that all unrepentant sinners, Christ rejectors, will not enter heaven, but will have their part in the lake of fire for eternity, which is the second death. So we've discovered the first few examples. Why sinners need to be accepted with fine or great invitation of saving grace. First of all, because of the person of Christ. Secondly, because heaven is exclusive. Heaven is a place for preferred people, a people who keep the commandments of God, who are in Jesus Christ, who are saved. But people who are born from heaven are Christ's rejectors, who have broken God's law and have never had their sins forgiven. Quickly as we move on, thirdly, I've almost finished. Another example of this is because of the solid and earned truthfulness of Scripture, verse 18 and 19. It says, For I testify unto every man, and hear the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto thee these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life. And out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Another incentive of this is because God's word is truth. It is solid, it is an earth. <coughs> it is of great importance in this final chapter of the Bible, which affirms the Bible, the word of God, to be faithful and true. Verse 6a. 
And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And God's word is faithful and true. God's word cannot be altered or tampered with. Anything added or removed it is concrete, it is sealed from eternity past, right through forever and ever. It is settled in heaven. And all scripture you see is by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. We touched on this this morning. What is right is profitable for reproof. What is not right it is profitable for correction. How to get right it is profitable for instruction and righteousness. How to stay right. God's word you see is set in heaven. It is eternal. It is inerrant. It is pure. It is perfect. Dear friends, don't come to God's word with your philosophy. Come to God's word on the revelation of God's word and take it objectively what it is saying. Because philosophy in God's eyes is nonsense. Folks, most people perish because they try to hop on to God's word or take away God's word to make up the imagination in their own mind. Instead of just taking God's word, his revelation, what mercy, what grace he has. What God was ever obligated to give anybody his word. All he we deserve is wrath. Solomon, a man of incredible wisdom, what did he say? Every word of God is pure. He is a shame unto them that put their trust in him. Ah, thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee. And now we find the liar. God's word does not change for modern society. No, it needs modern society or any society needs to submit and allow the word of God to change them. God's word is completely perfect. Any person who tries to add on from the full revelation of God. God says here, God will judge them severely by the plagues mentioned in the book of Revelation alone. I'll just give you in Revelation 9, in the, in the trumpet judgment, God sends demonic spirits to strike man, and they're going to be not much pain. It'll be like a scorpion pain. And in the day of the bow judgments, I'll read just a few out here to you in Revelation 16. It tells us here in Revelation 16 very quickly here as, uh, as a turnover. Verse 1, and I heard a good voice out of the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the bags, the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. And verse 2, and the first man that poured out his bag upon the earth, and there fell a loosened and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Verse also, verse 8 says, And the fourth angel poured out his bag upon the sun, and power was given on them to scorch men with fire. They talk about climate change. Verse 9. And the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed in the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Verse 10. And the fifth angel poured on his eye upon the seat of the base of his kingdom was full of darkness, and they know their tongues for pain, and blasphemed that God had them because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Do you want to be here when God's wrath is poured upon this world? God has said, if any man tampers with his word or tries to add on to his word, they will suffer the plagues of this book. And ultimately, the plague isn't the eternal plague, which is the lake of fire, but the torment will be forever and ever, it says. Revelation 14. The canon of scripture was closed, the book was finished. At the end of the first century, when revelation was completed. Any person who odds or takes away from scripture or false prophets, like Joseph Smith with the Mormons, like Mary Berger Eddy with Christian Zance, like Charles Russell, the JWs, and like Adam G. White, the Seventh day Adventists, that's just some, there's many more. And also many liberal so-called ministers, as they do not preach the true gospel or the whole counsel of God, in return they will be bored, no entrance in the heaven, verse 19, it says, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, you see false teachers do not preach, they take away the word of God, they don't preach
preach the whole counsel of God, they shall, it says here, any man take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which were written in this book. They will be born in the mountains of the heaven. Of course, no true believer who has experienced God's wonderful saving grace in Jesus Christ in verse 20, 21 will deliberately tamper with the word of God. Yes, they will make mistakes and errors at times with interpreting scripture, maybe wrong, especially in the early stages of their walk because we're always learning, but nevertheless they will have the right motive. They'll have a reference to the word of God. But those who know and love God will treat his word with the utmost respect. As the psalmist reminds us, O oh, I, O oh, I love thy law, I delight in your law. The true believer being a pattern of their life will believe, practice, guard, love and obey the Bible. It is precious to him or her. John concludes this great book of Revelation of Jesus Christ by reminding once again, a final reminder to his audience. Christ coming is in him, and an incentive for sinners to be preferred, first Monday. He would testify these things, saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. I wonder tonight, are you ready? Are you prepared for the day of the Lord God now? Have you experienced Christ's saving grace? And have the full assurance? Confidence that is with you. Verse 21 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have you had assurance? Have you had confidence? Are you prepared? Have you had saving grace in your life? Have you been called without a factual calling? Have you availed of Christ's ultimate sacrifice? There's no escape. The Lord is returning. But are you in the bride? Or will you suffer the judgments, the plagues which are in this book when God comes in wrath to punish the inhabitants of the world because of their sin? I trust tonight you have that full assurance that your sins are all gone, you have peace with God, and you're in Jesus Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Lord bless this word of God to us this evening. We'll sing our final hymn, why not? Uh, 283, 283, as we close our meeting tonight. Come, you sinners, there's the come again, the invitation. Come, you sinners, lost and hopeless. Do you see your position tonight if you're not in Christ? You're lost, folks. You're, you're, you're in a hopeless position, you do hope. It's only Christ and Savior. you. Jesus' blood can make you free. For he saved the worst among you, when he saved the rats like me. And I know, yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the brightest sinner clean. Okay, we'll stand please, we'll sing these four verses.